Episode 28 August the 28th, 1914 Helic Holland, A Stoker Saga By Klinkanocker Read by Tim Walton For sheer power of dramatic description, no naval writer of the Great War has exceeded a stoker aboard the destroyer HMS Hind, who under the pseudonym Klinkanocker, Mr. Joseph Leach, records his memories of the fortunate and fruitful naval action which is known as the Battle of Heligoland Bight. The first ribbon of light streaks the rim of the eastern horizon, flickering like a sickly flash in the darkest hour before dawn. The hind is cleaving her way through a sea as smooth as glass and as black as ink. A dim lamp sheds a tiny circle of light under the stern of the beaver, the destroyer ahead, and that tiny glimmer of light is the only one shown by every ship. It is to warn the ship astern not to come too close. On either side of us can be discerned shadowy phantoms of other destroyers, for we're steaming in divisions of four abreast. The fearless is lost in the darkness ahead, but we know she's there, and we place explicit faith in her leadership. Eight bells sounds, low and muffled. We have the morning watch, four to eight. The watchers need no rousing nowadays, because we're always on qui vive. We've been lying at our action stations with a pair of boots for a pillow, and the boiler room hatch is only a few yards away. I take a last long look at the dark blue dome of sky and wonder if it really will be the last. Thinking in this vein, I accompany my mates, Mac and Jack Garman, down into the boiler room. Here we'll remain until our reliefs get a chance to take our places. We envy them as they ascend to the upper deck because they'll be in the open air when the battle begins, and we'll know nothing until we are relieved. For about an hour we steamed at half speed, everything working slowly, and each of the three engrossed in his own thoughts. Then came the dull, muffled booms of reverberating gunfire. We stiffened to expectant activity. Full speed ahead, more steam, the telegraph clanged. We opened everything wide, and I kept very busy in the maintaining of 225 pounds of steam per square inch in the boilers, as it's utilised by the engines for the tactics required from the bridge. We are in action. Our guns belch forth death and destruction above our heads, and the ship reels drunkenly under the violent concussions. The boiler room in a naval action must be the nearest approach to hell on this planet. White-hot furnaces, boilers vibrating with their terrific high pressure. If a shell put the force draft fans out of action, we'd be charred to cinders by liquid flame and the backflash which would surely follow if the air pressure was cut off. And if a shell wrecked the boilers, we'd be boiled. We must not let our imaginations run riot down here, but it's hard to keep one's thoughts from straying to these things. This kind of fighting demands the purest form of courage. A man has to exercise perfect mastery over his emotions, carrying out his duties in a mechanical manner. I glance at my two companions. I know they're thinking the same things as I am. We laugh. Each tries to convey to the other that we don't care a damn but it's a pretense, and a poor one to boot. The action went on. After what seemed like an eternity, we were relieved. Betty Officer Gale, Farmer Ian Foy, seemed to think the action was over. They told us that some German destroyers had been sunk, and the Lizard and Lapwing were at that moment saving the crew of the German Commodore's vessel. We hurried on deck to see what was to be seen. The sight that met our gaze was the finest I've ever seen. On our port bow, the Fearless was engaging two German cruisers. 
and her tactics were masterly. She poured a broadside into one, and at the psychological instant, as the other fired a broadside, Fearless executed a masterly piece of tactics. She turned her bows to the foe, then slewed and poured a salvo into the enemy, and both Germans raced away in flames. They were burning fiercely as they disappeared, and no further fighting took place for a while. We chased the blazing enemies, but a mist had settled over the scene, and we lost sight of them. The crew were piped to breakfast and ate a hearty meal, and we heard all about the early morning fight from the seamen. Defender had also lowered boats to pick up the crews of sunken enemies, and a light cruiser opened fire on Defender, even in her merciful act of saving life. She had to run away and leave her boats to the mercy of an apparently pitiless enemy. Then up popped the British submarine E-8, who took the boat's crews off the Defender into her conning tower and gave the rescued Germans a compass and provisions and set them a course for the battle. She then submerged, and the boat's crews of Defender told us all about it when the flotilla returned to Harwich. After breakfast, we closed up at our action stations and the flotilla steamed steadily in the wake of the fearless, not a sign of the enemy until 10 a.m. Then we received a signal from two destroyers, Fire Drake and Lurcher, who'd escorted submarines to the German coast. They'd carried out their mission and were now being chased by enemy cruisers. Arethusa also signalled that she was engaging two enemy cruisers and was beating them off in our direction. We increased speed and followed fearless to the scene of the action. Arethusa lay disabled and full of shell holes. Most of her guns were out of action, and guns' crews lay dead and wounded on the upper deck. We counted 36 shell holes in her sides. Commodore Terwitt stood exposed on the bridge giving orders, with his flag lieutenant dead beside him, and the bodies of dead seamen lying near. It looked as though Arethusa had fought her first and last fight. Fearless then signalled, First Division of First Flotilla, attack with torpedoes. This was the first time in history that a torpedo attack was carried out in daylight, and we knew what to expect. Ariel was missing from the flotilla, being in dockyard hands for repairs, and Hein took a position in the First Division. Our objective was a large four-funnel cruiser, and we had only recently experienced a sample of German gunnery from this type of ship. The enemy cruiser looked like a fearful spectre in the distance, her sides lit up with gold and crimson flame, and she belched defiance at us. But she'd observed our daring intentions. It was very inspiring to watch the two destroyers ahead of us, racing at full speed through a cloud of spray towards the curtain of steel and water, as huge columns of water shot up where the enemy salvos fell. Acheron, Attack, Hind and Archer, in this order, seemed to fly through the sea, with a red and yellow pennant fluttering from the signal yards of each, the red and yellow flashes of the larger cruiser getting nearer and nearer as we raced into the kill. I experienced no sense of fear, but something inside of me made me wish I'd led a better life. I felt sorry for all the trouble I'd caused my mother in my younger days, and I made a mental vow that if I came through this ordeal alive, I'd lead a better life in the future. I've spoken to many since, soldiers as well as sailors, and all say they experienced the same emotions, but immediately were spared the good motives of forgetting and redo the same thing as before. Our smallness saved us. We saw the Akron discharge her two 21-inch torpedoes and she disappeared from view in a hell of shell-swept water, only to emerge again with her stern to the enemy as she raced away to safety. Attack was next and came out of the same manoeuvre. Now it was our turn. We got into position 
shells screamed over us. One salvo fell short to ricochet over us, and we were all swept with a deluge of water. Only our smallness saved us from being blown to eternity. One torpedo had sped on its errand of death, but something was wrong. We ought to have turned our stern to the enemy and be racing for safety, but still we lay with the shells falling around us. We glanced at our commanding officer who stood like a statue as he waited for the after torpedo to leave the ship. He shouted to White and myself to give a hand with the torpedo. We ran aft and found an engine room skylight open which would not allow the torpedo to be trained on the target. I jumped into the racer, dropped the hatch, and round came the target. I jumped out of the way not a fraction of a second too soon. I'd have been cut in two had I not moved so quickly. Hillcrest, the leading torpedo man, was seated at the tube taking his sight, and a shell took his cap off as the salvo skimmed over the deck. We bore a charmed life. By all the rules of war, say we should have been blown sky high before now. The archer was almost alongside us. She came to draw the enemy fire from us as we lay, as she thought, disabled. Our commanding officer thanked the commanding officer of the archer when we returned to Harridge. Shells were still raining around us while we raced out of range. Our attack had not given the mighty enemy the coup de grace, but the part we played had saved the Arethusa from destruction. Four large destroyers of the famous L-class now raced in to finish the job. What a terrific rolling they received. The commanding officer of Liberty had a leg shot off and was still giving orders clinging to the bridge rail when a shell took his head off. Her bridge was wrecked, but fortunately she survived. Laurel, Laertes and Lafori all emerged with decks running with blood. We saw men and guns disappear in the blinding flashes. Fearless then led us to look for more trouble, and we all engaged the mains with gunfire. On board this German light cruiser was the son of the greatest German sailor, Admiral von Tirpitz, and the son fought a gallant action against overwhelming odds. The mains were soon reduced to a shambles, lying helpless, a shattered hulk with dead and dying, strewing her upper deck. She hoisted the white flag and we received the order to cease fire. And the hind leo almost under the stern of the sinking mains, as the lower stoft and lurcher steamed alongside to take off the survivors, amongst whom was the son of Admiral von Turpitz. He was serving as first lieutenant in the ship. Our flotillas at this time were reinforced by a squadron of four light cruisers. We'd been fighting a losing battle against heavier vessels, and still more Germans were coming. At noon we sighted the Lion, Princess Royal, Queen Mary, Invincible, and New Zealand racing into the fray. We waved our caps and cheered ourselves hoarse as the mighty battle cruisers majestically steamed past, contemptuously leaving us to finish off the small fry while they went in search of bigger game. The lion fired one salvo at a three-funneled enemy and sent us to pick up what remained of her crew. We saw not a sign of any swimming German sailors, the cruiser having blown up. So ended the Battle of Heligoland Bight. At 1pm we had dinner, bully beef and bread, and Sir David Beatty gave us orders to escort the cripples home. It was while thirty when we relieved our comrades in the boiler room. They'd been having a rather anxious time. They said it had been the worst watch they'd ever kept, and so it was, both materially and spiritually. At 2pm we started for England, home and beauty, at six knots keeping a watchful vigil on our slow, limping, lame ducks. We were relieved at 4pm and had a little sleep after tea and felt ready for action again. We were still in any wee waters and anything might be expected. Sir David Beatty was guarding our rear with his battle cruiser. 
it was wonderful how secure we felt on every occasion that we saw the battle cruisers. We had a fright when darkness settled over the North Sea. On our starboard beam we saw the shadowy form of a four-funnel cruiser and expected a salvo of gunfire from her. To our surprise, a tiny light began to wink and continued to wink for a long time, and we wondered why. It was the Hoag, which executed a wonderful feat of seamanship by taking Arethusa in tow, and the only means of light in those enemy mortars was a tiny hand lamp. We reached Harwich at noon on the following day, and tied up alongside a new destroyer of even a later type than the Elves. This was the Miranda, first of the M-class to commission. She was manned by a good percentage of reservists, and how they enjoyed our story. The Arethusa went back into dockyard hands after only 40 crowded hours on the German Ocean. Thank you.